Jesus' name, we have a wonderful service. Amen. I will sing of the mercies of the Lord forever. I will sing of the mercies of the Lord. I will sing of the mercies of the Lord forever. I will sing of the mercies of the Lord with my mouth. Will I make known your faithfulness? Your faithfulness this morning with my mouth will I make known your faithfulness through all generations. Come on, I will sing of the mercies of the Lord. I will sing. I will sing. I will sing. Oh. about the presence of Jesus this morning. T.O.G., come on. Put your hands together for Jesus. You can do it much better. Is this your Sunday best? Come on. Clap your hands together for Jesus. Our God is worthy to be praised. Who bless your name. Good God. Good God. Good God. We give you the praise the mercy forever. Hey. Come on, everybody. Been around the world Searching for a miracle I found no one No one be like you so, Made so many places Searching for a better life I found no one Hey, 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 hey,
darkness into his light. He's our may maker. He's the way. He's not trying to show us the way. He's the way. He's the truth and life. He's the beginning and the end. He's the alpha and the omega. He's a profession. He's a, prof he's, he's a professor of our own faith. Hallelujah. Jesus, we honor you. Jesus, we reverence you. Thank you for living eternity into time. Because you know too well that that mansion we had to be with you. And therefore we give you praise, Jesus. We honor you, Jesus. Be glorified in this house. And be glorified in our lives. In the precious name of Jesus. I'll be leading us in praying for our church this morning. And I'll be leading us in from the book of Genesis chapter 1. In the book of Genesis chapter 1, the Bible declares, In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. But the trouble was that the earth was without form and void, and darkness was upon the face of the deep. And the Spirit of the Lord had to roam over the face of the waters. But God said something, Let there be light, and there was light. It was not the day he created the sun or the moon, for there was light. Therefore, we're going to ask for that light. It was that same light that, that, that Saul encountered on his way to Damascus. When he meet with that light, life becomes a turnaround for him. It's that same light that the book of the book of Corinthians tells us is the light that shines in darkness, and darkness cannot comprehend it. We're gonna pray for that light of heaven to shine over this church. Because the Bible says in Hebrews chapter in the book of Proverbs, chapter 4, verse 18. And then oh, he said, and he said, the path of the just is a bright shining light that shines more and more to the perfect day. We need that light like never before. That light is wisdom. That light is knowledge. That one light is, is, is vision, ability to see the future in the now. We're going to pray and say, Lord, let your light shine over our church. Let the light shine over this assembly. Let your light shine over our church like never before. People of God, I want us to pray this morning. If you, if you love your church, I want us to pray like never before this morning. Light from heaven. Uh, oh, we pray that you shine over this church this morning. Uh, light of God, shine on us. Uh, Rabadin the Sadik Lendos Kalaleros, Nanos Kalalentos Kerebriados, Nenos Kabandi, Lendo Minanana, Menda Fakin the Sunda Clan the Sara. We pray that your light will shine in this us. Let your light shine on us this day. Let your light shine over this assembly. Well, we pray, let your light shine over our church like never before. We pray for the greater light. We pray for the brighter light. We ask, let it shine brighter. Let it shine greater over the vision of this assembly. Lord, we ask, let your light shine, oh God. Oh, yes, Lord, let your knowledge of the glory of the Lord fill this house like never before. We ask, let your light shine, oh God. We pray that this light shine tremendously. Uh, let this light shine in the vision of our church. We pray let it, your light shine this morning. Let it give direction to the confused. Uh, let it bring order in areas of cold, in areas of, of chaos. We ask let light shine. Uh, let your light shine this morning. Let it shine on us in this new season. It's our year of new era. We ask, oh God, let it shine upon the heart, upon the mind of every individual. We ask, let your light shine, oh God. We pray for the light from heaven, uh, the light that ins intercepted the journey of Saul. Let it shine on us this day. Let your light shine, oh God. We pray for the light from heaven, uh, the light we pray, oh God, the light that brings about encounter, the light that gives direction, uh, the light that brings defense. We pray that the light shine on us, shine over our church, shine over the vision of our church, shine over the leadership of our church, shine over every individual. We ask to call light from heaven. Let, let it amend our way. Yes, Lord, we pray for light from heaven. Yes, Lord, we pray for light from heaven. In Jesus' mighty name we pray.
Judges chapter 6. We're going to pray lastly from the book of Judges. The book of Judges chapter 6. Hi, this is a man called Gideon. Here was an angel speaking to Gideon, and again, Gideon didn't understand this. The Bible says in Judges chapter 6, verse 12, and the angel of the Lord appeared unto him and said to him, Gideon, the Lord is with you. You are a man, of, you are a mighty man of valor. But listen to his answer in verse 15. So he said to him, My Lord, how can I save you? Indeed, my plan is the least, is the weakest in, in, in Manasseh. I am the least in my father's house. In other words, I don't have the potential. I don't have the capacity. I don't have the potential to do it. We're going to pray for ourselves as, as temple of glory this morning. Lord, activate that grace and potential for my greatness inside me. I pray this morning the heavenly Father. There's a greatness hidden on the inside of me. As, as, as an individual in this assembly, in this church, there's something in the inside of me. Activate that case, activate that potential. Lord, activate it. That I can be, I can profit from it and also benefit my generation. I want you to pray this morning. Father, I pray there's a grace on the inside of me. There's a potential, there's a capacity that I carry. I ask to God, my word is waiting. The Bible says the endless expectation of creation, they wait for the manifestation of the sons of God. They're not waiting for the children of God. They're waiting for the sons. Lord, I pray, oh God, as a son, let the grace, let the potential that you've hid on the inside of me, let it manifest in this year 2020. It's a new era. Let it manifest. Let it manifest. Let it manifest, oh God. Let it, let it, let it manifest. Every grace, let it be activated. All oh, that grace that is on the inside of me, let it be activated, oh God. Let the greatness on the inside of me, let it be activated, oh God. Thank you, Heavenly Father, for in Jesus' mighty name we pray. Amen. You can be seated in heavenly place. It's a new era. Let it begin. It's untold favor. We're walking in. in our midst in this new era. Let's briefly highlight what programs and events the church will be doing this year and what 2020 will look like. We will no longer have the entrepreneurship and business service. In its place, one Sunday a month, we will have Enterprise Development and Reformation Sunday. There will be one service on Sundays and the time is 9 a.m. Every month, including this month of January, we'll have a theme. The theme will be reflected in our teachings and messages on Sundays and the midweek service. This January, our theme is our New You Month. The first Sunday of the month is our communion and dedication service. One midweek service in the space of two months will be an interactive service where questions will be taken from the congregation. Get ready for a singles program which will hold around the Valentine's Day week in the month of February. There will also be a special Mother's Day and Father's Day. Also, there will be a Children's Day event to look forward to here in church. Get ready as DFD will host the HOP on the Sisterhood Train Month. 
there will be a mid-year prayer and fasting and a mid-year thanksgiving. Let's also prayerfully get ready this year for our crowning conference to celebrate the church's anniversary. The Tabernacle of David Choir will also host three big concerts this year. There will also be a men's three days conference and a Pillars Football League and Pastors Cup. Another thing to look forward to this year is the King's Banquet with Apostle Celia from the UK and many, many other highlights. Our Christmas event this year includes Welfare Day. There will also be an end of year Thanksgiving. Be prepared. Here are some of the ministry goals this year, 2020. To commence the TOG Academy, which will now comprise of Foundation School, Maturity School, and School of Ministry, it will now be certificated when completed with a diploma. There will also be two premarital classes in 2020. There will be a marriage clinic and a family month. We hope to start a parenting class and a free driving school. Also, one of our goals this year is to start work on our 300 square meter church office and hopefully move in this year. There's also a plan to upgrade a church home, Living Brooks, upgrade the landscaping and carry out major civil works and erosion control. We're looking at renovating and upgrading our youth church facility and our children's church classrooms. Our growth goal this year is that every individual member of the church should set a personal goal of bringing and keeping at least two new people in church. We should fill up our tent and even more this year. TOG, let's grow and advance the kingdom. Our presiding pastor will give more announcements. It's going to be a great 2020. Have a great year ahead. Pre-marriage counseling registration for intended couples is ongoing. Registration closes on Friday, February the 7th, 2020. Interested couples should please pick up forms at the church office or meet Minister Amaka Anderson. Classes start on Saturday, February the 22nd, 2020. Please note, there will only be two pre-marriage counseling classes this year. The next one holds later in August 2020. The right to become sons of God. But as many as received him, he gave the right to become children of God. There are powerful advantages to becoming sons. It is a right and an authority that is conferred by birthright or through legal adoption. A son has the right automatically to inherit all that the family has. This is a very powerful truth that we must not take lightly. Today, many Christians who have been legally adopted into the family of God are still far below their rights in the family of God. If you are a son of God, you must begin to press into the fullness of your redemptive and sonship rights. We receive these rights to sonship by believing and receiving Jesus Christ into our lives as our Savior and Master. It's that simple. We must begin to walk in our fullness and rights of our new birth and new creation realities. The world is waiting for your manifestation. You are a son of God. Welcome to your new era. We see a new you. God bless you.
19 days into the new era. God is already unfolding your destiny. Things are already happening. I mean, whether you don't see it, God is causing things to work together for your good. Yokes are breaking. Chains are dissolving. God is causing favor to rise up in your life. He's working things out for your good. Can you rise up on your feet and shout, Hallelujah! Remember it was when they shouted that the walls of Jericho came down. I don't know which walls are standing between you and that manifestation. What is standing between you and that revelation of God's will, God's goodness, God's mighty hand over your life. Shout it louder. Hallelujah! Everything standing between you and your manifestation is coming down in the name of Jesus. You will fulfill destiny. You will fulfill purpose. You will see the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. This is your year in Jesus' mighty name. Welcome to your new era. Please have your seats. Welcome to church. If you haven't said hello to someone in your side, tell them how nice they are looking. Hallelujah. <laughs> Praise the name of the Lord. My name is Oluwale Akinaja. It's my privilege to be an associate pastor in Temple of Glory. I have a special assignment today. Thank you. I have a special assignment today. There are a group of people we prayed for. We trusted God that you will be here. We trust God that this is going to be a wonderful day for you. If this is your very first time on a Sunday such as this in Temple of Glory, we'd like to recognize your presence. Just, just want you to come and just leave like that. If this is your first time, can you just wave your hands to me wherever you are? Okay, there's a hand over there. Is there anyone else? Hallelujah. Please rise up on your feet. Hallelujah. So we can see you and better appreciate you. If this is your first time, is there anyone else? Is there anyone else? Is your first time in Temple of Glory? Hallelujah. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Say, we will bless that you're blessed. You're blessed. You're blessed. In the morning time, you're blessed. Blessed. You're blessed. You're blessed. You're blessed. Hey. Come on now. Hey. You come and when you go.
drop their words at the children's church. Uh, children's church is a very, very powerful ministry. They will be blessed. Praise God. Hallelujah. Th next Sunday is Thanksgiving Sunday. Hallelujah. Woo! I said next Sunday is Thanksgiving Sunday. Anybody glad to be alive in 2020, in a new decade, in a new era? Hallelujah. There's plenty to thank God for. So if it's your wedding anniversary, your birthday anniversary, you want to thank God for something God has given you, you want to dedicate something, a new business, a new house, a new car, a new estate, hallelujah. We will be celebrating with you next Sunday. That's the 25th of January. Praise the name of the Lord. Somebody shout hallelujah. hallelujah. Our foundation school has also resumed this in session. Excuse me. If you are new in church and you want to be a part of our foundation school, please join us. It's 7.30 a.m. every Sunday. We had a great class today and it continues next Sunday at 7.30 a.m. Praise the name of the Lord. Hallelujah. This is important. If you want to be a full part of our church that you go through our foundation school, you'll be richly blessed. You'll be empowered to know more about God and to experience more of God. Hallelujah. Praise the name of Jesus. Praise the name of Jesus. Hallelujah too quiet in here. Praise the name of the Lord. Hallelujah. It's Minister Grace's birthday today. Hallelujah. Our resident culinary maestro. Hallelujah. Please rise up on your feet. Let's put our hands together. Appreciate God's minister, all of our ministers in the house. A faithful sister, a blessed sister in the house. We pray for you that God will give you a new level of favor, of wisdom, of supernatural help. This is your year of supernatural testimonies. It's your new era in Jesus' name. God bless you. The church appreciates you. On behalf of the presiding pastor, we celebrate you. Hallelujah. Somebody shout hallelujah. hallelujah. We would like to take our tithes and our offerings at this time. Praise the name of the Lord. Please, if you are giving your tithes in the house, can you please come forward? Hallelujah. Your heavens are already open. You are celebrating the fact that your heavens are open by giving your tithes. You are celebrating the fact that God loves you and that everything in your life belongs to him. Your tithe is your worship to the maker and to the creator of all things. Hallelujah. Thank you, Heavenly Father. Can you please come forward if you have your tithes, please? Thank you. Thank you, Heavenly Father. And start getting ready to give your offering also. I would like to read from the book of 2 Corinthians chapter 9, the Amplified Version of the Bible, verse 8. Thank you, Heavenly Father. 2 Corinthians chapter 9, the Amplified Version. If you have your tithes, please come forward. Hallelujah. It says, and God is able to make all grace, every favor, an earthly blessing come to you in abundance so that you may always and under all circumstances, whatever the need, be self-sufficient, possessing enough to require no aid or support. How many would like that? Requiring no aid or support. No, somebody help me. And furnished in abundance for every good work, charitable donation. Oh, come on now. You are moving to a new level by this tithe in the name of the Lord Jesus. You are moving to a new level by this offering in Jesus' name. Can you lift up your, your tithe? Thank you, Heavenly Father, for those who have committed to worship you, committed to love you by the giving of their tithe this morning. I declare, according to your word, that the heavens are truly open. Amen. It's a new season, it's a new era for their lives. Every area of their life that need repair, that need reformation, we speak reformation. We speak repair. We speak the rebuilding of ruins. We speak the restoration of desolate heritages. We declare, Heavenly Father, that you cause your blessing to come upon them more than have enough room to receive Amen. supplies, ideas, creativity, and breakthrough on every side. Their lives will never remain the same again in Jesus' name. Amen. Please just have the communion over there. Drop your tithes and have the communion. You are blessed in Jesus' name. Please, if you are giving your offering, please rise up on your feet and hold your offering in your hands. Hallelujah. He says God is able to make all grace. God wants to release grace. There's a transaction about to take place. As you release your offering, grace is released to you. What would that grace do for you? Whatever you need. It's not just for finances. It's for healing. It's for deliverance. He says all grace. All grace means all. I don't know what you're trusting God for, but there's a grace. There's a capacity. There's a favor about to be unleashed through your giving this morning. Lift up your offerings. Father, I thank you for everyone that is given. According to your word, I declare that grace is made available. Help is made available. Supernatural favor, unmerited favor. The power to be congratulated is made available to every man, every woman, every child given an offering today. We declare ourselves blessed, highly favored. We celebrate your mercy. We celebrate your love in Jesus' mighty name. Let's give our offerings. Double of David. Today, oh, I will lift up my voice in praise. Today, oh, I will lift up my voice in praise. For I know, yeah, yeah, for me, yeah, 
carry this woman of this building. Our Father, anybody new in this house this morning? All things that passed away, say you have made me new.
season where God is doing new things and God cannot do new things without you because we are his agents on earth here. Yeah? God is looking for vessels to use. So as you stand, begin to ask God this morning, make me your vessel. Make me an offering, an offering unto you. Make me whatever you want me to be. Begin to ask God to make you his vessel. Father Lord, this morning we come before you. We acknowledge, oh God, that we are not our own creator. Lord, you created us. Lord, you knew each and every one of us even before time began. Father, we acknowledge you this morning as the author and the finisher of our faith. Father, we thank you, oh God, because everything concerning our lives has been written in your book before, Lord, we were born. And therefore, Lord, you have our whole life, the stages of our lives planned out before us. And oh God, because of the crucial and strategic season that we are in, Father Lord, we know that you are looking for vessels that you can pour out your new wine. So Lord, this morning we ask, Lord, Lord, that you make us your vessel. We acknowledge it's not by power, Lord, it's not by might, Lord, but by your spirit. And so, Lord, this morning we ask you, O oh God, by your help and the help of the Holy Spirit, Lord, help us to be positioned accurately in the way you want us to be so that we can receive of the new wine. Father, that in this season, in this dispensation, in this new era, Lord, that you find us like you found Mary, the mother of Jesus Christ. Oh, Lord, to favor us. Oh, Lord, to appoint us. Lord, to choose us, oh God, to, you, to be your very own and to be instruments, oh God, in your hands. Oh Lord, to be your heart, Lord, to be your eyes, Lord, to be your hands, and oh Lord, to be whatever you want us to be, even in this time. Father, for we did not create ourselves. Father, Lord, you're the maker, the manufacturer of every product. Product creates the product for a specific purpose. And oh Lord, we ask, oh Lord, that will fulfill purpose. Lord, we ask your kingdom come in our midst this evening. Your way of doing things, your government, your rulership, your culture, your mindset, your mentality, everything that you are, all that you are, oh God, your essence, oh God, come in our midst this morning in the mighty name of Jesus. Father, Lord, I will not leave your presence this morning without having an encounter with you. Holy Spirit, we ask that you take absolute control of this service. Holy Spirit, that you move, that you choose to move as you want, that even as we listen to the word this morning, that you speak clearly to us in the name of Jesus. Lord, I commit myself into your hands. Father, Lord, I pray that you give me utterance. Lord, that you make my lips like the pen of a ready writer. That my heart will indict of a good matter. That my heart, oh Lord, will flow with a good theme. Lord, that my mouth will speak with wisdom. And oh Lord, the meditations of my heart will give understanding. Father, Lord, I take authority over this atmosphere. And oh Lord, I enforce your government, your kingdom, and all that you represent. I legislate, oh God, over this atmosphere. And I command a total destruction of every demonic and every satanic pattern, every imagination of the heart, Lord, that is contrary, oh Lord, to your will for today, for all that you have ordained and all that you have predetermined for consigning today's service. Father, we bring those thoughts, oh Lord, those imaginations of the heart, any argument, oh God, that is being raised up in the heart of any man, we take them captive this morning and we bring them under the authority of the name of our Lord Jesus Christ and of the blood of Jesus Christ. And oh Lord, we ask that you have your way in our midst this morning, that you come and you reign as God the King, God the Judge, and God the Lawgiver to save and deliver us in the mighty name of Jesus. Lord, we command everything that is not of you to give way. Oh Lord, under your presence this morning, any stranger, any alien, any foreigner, we say according to your word, you hear our voice, you obey us, and you scamper and flee out of this place in the name of Jesus. Father, we ask, oh God, for your open heavens. Father, we ask for an outpouring of your spirit upon our lives this morning. Father, we give you all the praise. Lord, we give you all the glory. Lord, we give you all adoration in the name of Jesus. Amen. Hallelujah. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. Please take your seat. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Thank you so much for coming to church this wonderful Sunday morning. I always say that because to me every day is a wonderful day. Hallelujah. I see good and you hear about um, um, soon. Everything I look at the positive, I never look at the negative. And so I believe coming into the presence of God on a Sunday morning such as this is the best thing that can happen to you. And so the word of God says, with joy you shall, dwell, um, uh, you shall, you shall draw out of the worlds of salvation. You know, the, you, you, a lot of times the, the word of God expects us to walk by faith. You don't walk by your feelings. You don't walk by the physical. You consistently day in and day out, no matter what the situation is, you walk by faith. Hallelujah. And so this morning, I believe that you came to church expectant. I believe that you already have received in your heart, in your spirit, in your mind, all that you are trusting 
God because that is faith. Faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things yet not seen. So you possess, you know, that which you believe in your hands, your, not your physical hands, in your mind before you, it's delivered into your hands. Hallelujah. And one of the expressions and indication of faith is joy. If you say you have faith and you don't have joy, then that, you are not walking in faith. You know, the word of God says in James that faith without works is dead. One of the works of faith is joy. You know, the, the, the James said in, 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 in his um, later, you know, um, the, the book of James, he says, you know, show me your, your works, you know, and I'll show you my faith by my works. You know, faith without works is dead. And so an expression as children of God, every one of us will have a deposit and a measure of faith. And so it's left for us to activate Less for or us to maximize and grow that faith in us. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. So welcome to church. Like we know we are in a new era. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Say to your neighbor, you are in a new era. Hallelujah. And if you come into church for so long, I'm sure you understand what this new era is. Pastor and I have tried to do so much to make you understand. You know, because like we keep saying, you cannot maximize that which you do not know. And this time, this year, this decade, which is a 10-year period, and by revelation that God gave us a 20-year circle, you need to understand what it means, what it contains, and what it represents so that you can maximize all that God has, you know, put inside of it. Because like we always say, that time is a container, time is a carrier, and time is a dispenser of the purposes of God. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. So we are in a new era, and like I'll, I'll quickly again, because you like we keep saying in this church, the truth you know, the level of liberty, the level of progress as a Christian, the level of breakthrough you will experience in your life or you are experiencing right now or you have experienced in the past or you will experience in the future is proportional to the level of truth you know and understand. And so we should seek truth always. We shouldn't only, only seek truth. We should seek understanding. We should seek wisdom. The word of God says wisdom is the principal thing. And in all you're getting, get understanding. And so we need to seek, you know, if you want to really thrive in these days that we are in, if you want to really thrive in this new era, then you have to seek wisdom. And like we began to say, wisdom is the right or accurate application of truth. Wisdom, like I, I, I have said before, two people can have the same information, can have the same knowledge, but they apply them differently. And because the application is different, definitely the results that will come out of that application will be different. You know, but if you are a wise person, you always know how to apply the information and the knowledge you have accurately so that you can, it can yield the kind of result it's supposed to yield to you. Praise the Lord. You know, and we said, of course, all over the world, both the secular and the spiritual world, we've heard so much about year 2020. But then as the children of God, we are not like, we are not like outsiders. We need to see everything by revelation. We shouldn't see everything in the flesh. You know, we shouldn't see everything physically. That's why God has given us a spirit with our constant communion with the Holy Spirit. You know, during the prayer and fasting, Pastor did a very good job on, you know, communion and fellowship with the Holy Spirit. If you're always in communion and fellowship with the Holy Spirit, you see with the third eye. You'll be able to discern, you know. The Word of God says in 1 Corinthians 12:32. You know, that the sons of Issachar had an understanding of their times. And so at every point in time, they, they knew what to do. And so if you are a Christian, you know, God expects you to understand times and seasons. Because your strategies, your plans, your visions, everything you need to do must come out of and flow out of what God is doing per time, per season. You cannot be outside of God's prophetic agenda and expect that the hand of God will be upon you. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. And so, you know, I, I, was, I was reading somewhere in, in Hebrew, the number 20, the, you know, normally Hebrew, um, the Hebrew language, they, they, they write out their numbers in, 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 um, in illustrations like, you know, and the number 20, they said, I read somewhere that the, 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 the symbol of number 20 is the hand. And so to them, they, they, they are saying, well, the number 20 means that the hand of God will work mightily in your life in this season. And especially, now that it's 2020, that means it's double hand. You know, so, you know, so that is actually how you interpret, as, as a kingdom person, that is how you interpret the mysteries of the kingdom. When the disciples of Jesus Christ came to Jesus and began to ask him and said, why do you always speak in parables? 
And Jesus Christ said, to you it has been given, you know, to know the mysteries of the kingdom. But to those who are outside, they have not been given that. That is in Matthew chapter 13, talking about the parable of the sower towards the end of chapter 13, you know. And so God expects us and places a responsibility on us for us to seek knowledge, to seek understanding, to get wisdom and walk in wisdom and understanding. Isaiah 33 verse 6 says, wisdom and knowledge shall be the stability of your time and the strength of your salvation. Hallelujah. And so this morning, I'm going to go ahead to continue from where pastor stopped. You know, um, this month, pastor has said we'll be doing, has dedicated this month, you know, as dealing with the new you. The new you. And like we know, to God and even to us, and the most important thing is not about what we achieve at the end of the day. It's not about the results that come out of our lives, but it's the transformation that, that happens in our lives personally that is the most important thing. And so to God, it's very easy, you know, for God to do what he needs to do in your life. It doesn't take anything. It takes a twinkle of an eye in one second, in one moment, to, for God to break through for you and do what you are believing and trusting God for. But God is more in, interested in you as a man. God is more interested in the vessel. God is more interested in your capacity, in your character. God is more interested in who you are. You know, because when you are able to, uh, to become all that God expects you, then God will now be able to release that which he wants to release to you. Praise the Lord. And so Pastor began to talk about the new you. He said, you know, um, you, you cannot, you know, um, 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 you cannot get what God wants to do in this season by remaining the old you. And we look at true scriptures. Anytime God wants to do something new in the lives of people. If you were here on Wednesday, pastor started a message on Sunday and completed it on Wednesday. If you are not here on Wednesday or last Sunday, please get the CDs. Because this is, um, this is the second part of that message. He talked about the spiritual man, the new spiritual you. Praise the Lord. Media, give me First Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 23. Pastor used, Pastor's um, 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 main scripture last week was Isaiah 43, 19 to 18. He says, you know, you know that scripture is very popular. You know, he says, um, do not remember the former things or the things of old. Behold, I do a new thing. But First Thessalonians 5, 23 says, now may the God of peace himself sanctify you completely completely and what does it mean to be sanctified completely may your whole spirit soul and body be preserved blameless at the coming of our lord jesus christ media does leave this scripture here you know the complete man a complete man is made up of three parts man is a tripartite being which means man is made up of three parts and that's what this scripture is saying if god if god is going to sanctify you completely you have to sanctify your spirit you have to sanctify your soul, and then you have to sanctify your body. And so a complete man, you can take up the scripture now, a complete man is spirit, is soul, and then body. Man is a spirit that has a soul and that lives in a body. And so for you to be complete and balanced and total, you must pay attention to your spirit, you must pay attention to your soul, and then you must pay attention to your body. The spirit is so important because it's the spirit that has communion with God. It is through the spirit that we contact and have a relationship with God. God is a spirit, you know. And like the word of God says, they that worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. And so as a child of God, your spirit must be very strong to be able to assess everything that God, you know, God wants for you or God is saying to you. Pastor began to deal with the new spiritual you on Sunday and he completed it on Wednesday. So I'll ask again, get the CDs for Sunday, last Sunday and Wednesday. Today I'll be dealing with the soul of man. The soul of man is the, the, that part of uh, man, you know, that, that is like the intermediary or is between the spirit and the body. The soul of man is actually very, very important. People who think, and you hear, and I'll go to that later, people who think the spirit of man is so important because that's what you communicate with God. But if your soul, if your spirit is weaker than your soul, then you have no use to God. And I'll tell you, uh, before the end of the mission stage, you see, when John the Baptist, who was the forerunner of Jesus Christ, came, when Jesus Christ himself came, the first thing Jesus Christ dealt with was the mind. 
and we are going to look at the scriptures shortly. I'm sure a lot of you are shocked. You know that kind of thing that he didn't begin to deal with the spirit. If you see, if you if you go to Matthew, you know I'll I'll I'll, 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 I'll deal with bad because we are dealing with the soul and we are going to deal with the mind. The soul is made up of, of, of the mind, the emotions, and the will. And some people say the soul, like if you are going to classify what the soul is made of, include the conscience and include also the imagination. But then, um, generally, we know that the soul is made up of the mind, the spirit, the mind, the emotions, and the will. You know? And so when Jesus Christ came, John the Baptist first came as a foreigner. And what did he begin to tell the people? He says, repent. For the kingdom of God is at man. What is repent? Change your mindset. Change your mind. That was the first message that John the Baptist brought. And the second, and when Jesus Christ came after, in, I will look at the scripture later. You know, the first thing Jesus Christ began to deal with was not with the spirit of man, but with the mind of man. And Jesus Christ himself also said, repent for the kingdom of heaven has come or is near or at hand. And so the mind of man is so important. The mind of man is your personality. That's where your identity comes from. You know, the body deals with the physical. The body ha is deals with the five senses. Your sight, your touch, your smell, your taste, and all those things. And so if your body is in control of your soul, it means your decisions and everything you do will be natural. You, you, you are, you'll be like the person that is referred to as the carnal mind. And the word of God says that the carnal mind cannot please God. You know, let's look at uh, Romans chapter 8, I think verse 7. Media, give me Romans 8, 7. Okay, let's go to verse 6. Let's see. For to be carnally minded is death. But to be spiritually minded is life and peace. Leave the scripture here first. Carnally minded. I'm talking about the mind now. Spiritually minded. Already I, I said that they leave the scripture there. I want to explain something. The, the, I, already I said that the soul is between the spirit and the body. The soul actually, a lot of people think, and I began to say, that a lot of people think that the spirit is actually the most important thing. But if your soul is in control, your spirit is no longer important. Because your soul, your mind will control you. And if your mind controls your, your spirit, then the word of God says, it is death. So what is the importance of your spirit when your spirit is so weak and can't be in control of your mind? You know, so the, to, to be carnally minded, that is, to be carnally minded means you are controlled by the physical. You are controlled by what you see you are controlled by what you hear. You are controlled by what you eat or taste. You are controlled by your senses, your feelings, what you, the, your, your, you know, what happens to your body. And if you are controlled by the physical, if you are controlled by, the, by what you see, then you are carnally minded. But the word of God expects us to be controlled by the spirit because the spirit does not see what we see in the physical, the spirit see what we see spiritually. And so if what you controls your life is what you are seeing and receiving by revelation from the spirit, then you are spiritually minded. So for to be carnally minded is death, but to be spiritually minded is life and peace. Continue verse 7. Because the carnal mind, like I said, you already have a spirit, but even with your spirit, if you are carnal, the word of God says, because the carnal mind is enmity against God, for it is not subject to the law of God, nor indeed can be. And so when Jesus Christ came and done the part this, they began to say, repent, change your mindset, change your mentality, change your, 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 your attitude, because that's where the real power is. Who you are today and who you will be tomorrow is a sum total of your mind, your thoughts. How you will excel, even in your spiritual work, is also a sum total of what is going on in your mind. What you are aligned to having preeminence. And so your life, and this is a, a true statement, will, will, will go towards your predominant thoughts. You have a spirit, but your life is going to go, is what you are thinking about, 
The word of God says in Proverbs, when they are put it up, Proverbs 23, verse 7, as a man thinks in his heart, so is he. So eventually your personality, your identity, what controls your life in this world is your mind that is in full control by the spirit. And so as, for, as a, he thinks in his heart, so is he. This sums up everything about a man. Wherever you are today, tell yourself the truth. It's as a result of what has been occupying your mind for a long time. And wherever you will be tomorrow will be as a, as a, as a result of your thoughts. I think it was um, Miles Morrow or maybe Chris Ayaklemo I was looking at. He says your face is a reflection of your thoughts. Your life today is a reflection of your thoughts. Who you be tomorrow will be a reflection of what you are thinking today. And so, talking about the mind, which is a key element in the soul, and which I'm talking about today, your mentality, your mindset, your set of beliefs, you need to manage your mind. You need to manage your thoughts. You need to manage your, 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 your um, they say control what is going through your heart. And you need to bring them all in alignment with the spirit. And we know what the spirit is. The word of God also is the spirit, the Holy Spirit. Praise the Lord. And so it's so important. You cannot be bigger than your thoughts. You cannot be bigger than the, your thoughts. And so the most, you know, uh, my mantra in life, and it's still my mantra, I think I, 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 I started working with it um, when I was like about 13 years old. And it's still my mantra. I say I don't believe in self-deception. I do not. I tell myself the truth. You deceive yourself if you do not tell yourself the truth. And you're, I, I, sit, I talk to myself a lot. I spend a lot of time talking to myself. I enjoy talking to myself. And one of the greatest moments in which I use in talking to myself is when I drive. You know, a lot of people like to have a driver, but I enjoy driving. When I'm driving, I talk to myself, I smile, I laugh, I'm just talking, meditating. That is where I sort out a lot of issues in my life when I drive, you know. And so we must cultivate the habit of talking to ourselves and telling ourselves the truth. We must always cultivate that habit. We must always, because you're, you're thinking. You know, um, 15 years ago, um, the first time I ever had the opportunity of preaching on a Sunday like this was actually 15 years ago in my former church. I was given the opportunity to, to preach in the three services. And the reason why um, the senior pastor gave me that opportunity was because she was always hearing me talk about the power of understanding. She was always hearing me talk about the power of the mind. She was always hearing me talk about the power of um, thinking and the power of vision. And so I, I think she was doing a series that year, and she now said, on him, I want you to come and preach this Sunday, you know. And I titled, and I think that is one of my... Um, classic, one of my most, um, you know, at that time, 15 years ago, but I got everything from the first word to the last, God inspired me. And I titled that message, Think Your Way to Greatness. Think Your Way to Greatness. Think Your Way to Greatness. You can actually become great by what you think about, what you meditate on, what your mind is full of. Think your way to greatness. You know, I always say to people, you know, I was going to start from that, but I didn't start to that understanding, you know, the circle that we're in. Let me talk about that briefly. 20 years circle, which came by revelation. I'm not going to go through that. If you are not here during our prayer and fasting, please get all the messages so that you understand why we are talking about a 20 year circle. You know, I keep saying that we, we walk by revelation and prophetically we are in a 20 year circle. And I said, well, the world is interpreting the decade, you know, um, by 10th year period but we work by revelation because everything is a sign and so if there is 2020 double why should we be trusting God for 10 which is half of 20 20 is the double of 10 so why in everything you are trusting God for and so part of what how you apply wisdom you also review the 20 years the last 20 years of your life what have you lost because we are talking about the number 20 being the number of redemption what do you want to gain back into your life in this, um, in this um, next 20 years? Because God is actually saying, open your mouth wide and I'll feel it. You know, as I was, um, during worship, 
I remember when Elisha was about to die, he went to the king of um, Jerusalem, of Israel, and he said, take the uh, arrows and strike the ground. And the king um, struck the ground only three times. And then Elisha said, well, you know, God was about to give you, you know, more victories than the three times that you struck. If only you had struck more. You just struck three times when you had the opportunity to keep striking and striking and striking and striking and striking. If only you had struck more than three times, but now you only struck three times. And that is what God is going to give to you. So what am I saying to you? There is hidden wisdom in the number 20. There is a hidden wisdom for our glory, you know, that God has tied to this season. And so it's a number, 2020 is double. So don't think of 10 years, think of 20 years. Somebody like me, that's what I'm practicing in my life. Well, this is what I'm going to say it may sound a little bit vain, but I seize every opportunity. To me, there's nothing that is vain, spiritual, everything about my life, spirit, soul, and body. I apply the principle of God. You know, normally people will say, she is 10 years younger. We hear it's a common saying. This year, I said to God, we are in a, a, a season of 20s. We are in a season of doubles. And so I'm going to believe you to look 20 years younger. True. I said to God, I said, why will I ask to look 10 years younger? Why will I ask to have the strength of a 40-year-old? Because I'm going to be 50 in like three months' time. When I can ask God for a strength, the strength, the body, the looks, the, the what, you know, God says he renew our youth like an eagle. Pastor talked about the eagle a lot last week. Why will I ask for 10 when I can ask for 20? And so that's what I'm asking for. And why will I think of just 10 years when I can secure the next 20 years of my life? You know, why should we stay with 10 when we have the grace and the opportunity to demand for 20? So that's actually also the wisdom behind that. You know, so, um, uh, what was I even talking about? You know, so, um, you know, your mind, what you feel and think about controls your life. And so the first thing I would like to say, because you keep saying that this year, year 2020, is the first of the decade and the first of the 20 year cycle. And like we said, um, the first is very important. If you look at the principle of the, of the first fruit, I think in Romans chapter 11, it says, it says, if the first fruit be holy, then the rest will be holy. If the root be holy, then the branches will be holy. So this year, we know the first of the 10-year period, the decade, the first of the 20-year period is a foundation laying year. And what does it mean to be a foundation laying year? It means it's the year that will support the remaining years. It's the year that will uphold and carry the remaining years. So what, and that's why pastor is dealing with the new you. Because the new you, if we can get everything together about the new you, then we'll be able to flow through, you know, the next 10 years, 20 years. Of course, we'll keep renovating, reforming, and everything. But the first thing I want to say today, I'm talking about, you know, your mental mindset quickly is that, you know, uh, if you are here, like I said, I can't go back into that. Prophetic language, we are in a 20-year cycle. I said about how God gave me a word in year 2000 about crossing the Jordan, which um, Pastor Deboe and, and Benihim, you know, you know, confirmed. The word of God says, in the mouth of two or three witnesses, a matter is established. And I said at the end of last year in October, on the, precisely on October 1st, God got my attention in the scripture in Joshua, Joshua chapter 1 verse 11. He says, um, um, go to the camp, command the officials of the, of the children of Israel to go to the camp, to tell the children to prepare provision, you know, to cross for in three days, they will cross over the Jordan to possess the land which I've given them to inherit. And I said in the body of Christ prophetically, in year 2000, God gave a word away we are to cross the Jordan, but it has taken a 20-year circle for us to get into full circle of that word. You know, to God, a thousand years is like a day, and a day is like a thousand years. So God can give you a word today, but it goes through a process, and then when well, it's only God that determines the end of that process because of his prophetic agenda, and when the process is completed, it comes into fullness, and that is what we call full circle, and then it shifts you. And so when God gave me that scripture in October, he reminded me of the word he gave that the time had come for the body of Christ to cross the Jordan 20 years ago. And then at the end of 2019, he said the time has come to actually cross it. And he said you will cross. And so if you look at the story of the children of Israel, Joshua, if you go to Joshua chapter 4, you know, we'll start from there. Um, uh, media, give me Joshua chapter 4. You know, um, we'll start from there. When the children of Israel crossed the Jordan, the first place they camped was a place called Gilga. Gilgal became the base camp where they now started going from Gilgal to do the initial con conquest. From Gilgal, they went to Jericho. They did different tribes. 
and then they, they took over Jericho, came back to Gilgal, those who, you know, were, you know, they were going, the initial conquest, the base was Gilgal. And the base is ma mainly the under of something that supports the team, the base camp. And if you look at the dictionary definition, foundation, one of the definitions of foundation is that the foundation is the base that carries and supports, you know, something, a structure. And so Gilgal was like a base. What happened in Gilgal? Joshua chapter 4, quickly, because we are talking about, I, I, I'm talking about, I'm, I'm talking also about the mind, because it's actually important, you know, what we do. You know, so Joshua chapter 4, verse 13. Verse 19. 4, verse 19. Now the people came up from the Jordan on the tenth day of the first month, and they camped in Gilgal on the east border of Jericho. Let's go to chapter 5. Joshua chapter 5, verses 2 to 9. At that time, the Lord said to Joshua, Make flint knives for yourself and circumcise the sons of Israel again the second time. So Joshua made flint days are evil. Redeeming the time, that means buying back time. And what does it mean to buy back time? In time, there will be so many opportunities. And how you maximize the opportunity will determine what you redeem back into your life. And so when we say redeeming the time, God is giving us like, people are saying, the world is saying, decade, 10-year period, but we are buying 20 years. We are taking 20 years you know, out of our life. So that's it. Okay, so for all the land which you see, and like I said in Jeremiah 1 verse 11, it says, you have seen well, of Jeremiah 1, um, um, 1 12, it says, you have, for you have seen well. For all the land which you see, I give to you and your descendants forever. Okay, verse 15, all the land. So this is God. God has not changed. He's the same yesterday, today, and forever. God has not changed. And so part of what we are asking you in this particular, in Abraham's scripture, God renovated Abraham's um, vision because God was about to do something in Abraham's life and it was, it was mandatory for Abraham to have the right vision. And that's why God began to say, lift you, you, before now, you know, Pastor talked about it, I think it was last Sunday or Wednesday, he talked about the term myopic vision. Myopic vision was, uh, myopic vision is, is nearsightedness. You only see things that are close to you. You know, I remember some years ago when God was talking to me about using this scripture. As I was reading through it, that was when I went to do a study on myopic. The word myopic dropped in my spirit. And God was simply saying to me, Abraham before then had a myopic, myopic vision. But uh, because all Abraham could think about was the present, his immediate um, 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 uh, um, surrounding community, his son, having a son and everything. But God wanted him to think more than that. And so God led that principle. God is futuristic. God is not a God that thinks small. God is not a God that limits something. So don't limit yourself to 10 years. That's all I'm trying to get. So expand the capacity of your mind. You know, we began to talk about um, uh, singing the song, Make Me a Vessel. You know, the word of God says, I think it's in uh, Matthew chapter 19, I'm not sure about um, the new wine skin. He says, you know, um, you can't put new wine into an old wine skin. Because if you put new wine into an old wine skin, the old wine will burst. The old wine skin will burst and the new wine will be spilled. Why can't you put new wine into an old wine skin? The old wine skin is already old and set. It can't stretch. It can't expand. And so God is saying, if I'm going to do anything new in your life, you have to become new. Because if you remain with the old, you will not be able to contain that which I'm about to do. God is a progressive God. And that's why the word of God says, you know, the part of the just man is like a shining light that shines brighter and brighter onto the perfect day. If you are thinking of 20 years, think of all the things, technology, think about the big things. And so your new you now should begin to reflect and think of the big things God wants to do. That is what God is expecting us to do. Because if we remain with this mentality, we will not be able to carry or have the capacity to carry what God wants us to do. And so we must first, like Romans chapter 12, let's look at Romans chapter 12 verse 2. We must begin to renew our mind. We must, we must begin to renew, and do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing 
of your mind. It means your mind was there before, but you not need to renew it. It means your mental belief and your mentality was there before, but you need to renew it. And do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. You know, God's will, God, with time, God reveals mysteries. For you to understand the progressive will of God, for you to have a prophetic insight, which is vision, into God's mind, then you have to consistently renew your mind. It is your responsibility to renew your mind. And one of the major things in which you need to use to renew your mind is the word of God. And then you also need to feed yourself with certain things that will change, you know, take your old thoughts and replace with new thoughts and then you renew your mind. You know, let me say something. You know, in life, you know, and I, I, I'm going to give this illustration because in life, you must learn and it must be a deliberate choice that you see life positively and not negatively. At every point in time, of course, we know the famous saying that says, there is a glass that is half. Some people will say this glass is half full. Some people will say it is half empty. Those who say it is half full, they are positive-minded people. Those who say it is half empty, they are negative-minded people. And in life, when you are confronted with a situation, and what you see is negative, that situation becomes a problem to you. But when you are confronted with a situation and you can see the positive in, positive in it, it becomes an opportunity for you. And that is how you are going to redeem life. In the course of this next one year, in the course of this next 10 years, in the course of this next 20 years, the fact that you are in the center and the perfect will of God for your life does not mean you are not going to face challenges. But when you face a challenge, are you going to look at it negatively and now it becomes a problem that consumes you that you can't move forward or do anything with your life? Or are you going to look at it positively and then you see the opportunities that are tied into that, um, that situation or circumstance and it moves you forward? You know, like Pastor began to say, like the eagle, a quantum leap. You begin to mount up because eagles ride on the storms. The storms don't bring them down. The storms push them upwards. And so that is why you need to renew your mind. As you need to renew your mind in every aspect of your life. You know, this is, may, may not be a perfect example. But I remember, and like I say, you need to renew your mind by the words of God. I remember um, um, maybe like um, um, 13 years ago when we lost our daughter. I did not allow sorrow to consume my heart. I began to look for ways to renew my mind. One of the first things I did, I, I, I have this book, Robert, Robert Schuller, Tough Times Never Last, But Tough People Do. I've gone back to that book and read it over and over. Anytime I'm faced with a situation, I go back to that book. I have so many copies of it. Because sometimes when I'm looking for one, I can't see. I immediately go to the bookshop, I buy another one. It says, tough times do not last, but tough people do. And one of the most important statements he made in that book that transformed me, that I began to walk in a state of joy. He said, never concentrate on what you lose. Concentrate on what you have left. So I took that sentence. I said, I'm not concentrating on what I have lost. I'm concentrating on what I have left. I have a husband and I have two sons. And so I'm not going to focus on the past anymore. And then also immediately I began to see the word of God says, except a corn of wheat falls to the ground, it abides alone. You know, a, 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 not a corn of wheat, pastor has corrected me so much, a grain of wheat, yes, falls to the ground, you know, but then when it goes down, it brings out so much fruit, and because my mindset was right, I went through that circumstance and that situation with the right mindset, the right mental belief, you would never see me sad or depressed at any point that season, a lot of people walk up to church, in ch after church, I will say, you see, I remember one particular person, you know, um, Brother Joaquin that was here, we were in the same church at one point. There was one particular Sunday, he came and met pastor after service. He said, when I was coming to church this morning, when I got dressed up, and every night I started my car, my car refused to start. He said, that destabilized my whole day. And so when I came to church during praise and worship, I was so depressed and sad that my car did not start this morning. I was thinking about my car, how much money, and then I looked at you. I saw how you were praising God and how you were worshiping God. And then I became so ashamed of myself. I said, this is just a car that did not start this morning that I can fix always. And I'm not able to praise God. I'm not able to worship God. You know, so the state of your heart, the state of your mind 
will come, will, will determine your attitude. A lot of people, we, God used us to give a lot of hope to a lot of people. That in the midst of your trying times, you can still rejoice and be glad. And that is why some of you, there's so much you have to thank God for. But you come into the presence of God as if somebody is begging you to praise God. Sometimes you need to know what other people have gone through and have still maintained their joy. Count your blessings and name them one by one. I always say to people that the time that I began to dance the way I dance was from there. God gave me, says, I, I, I found myself dancing and I had to go and do a research on dancing. And I found out that every time God talked about money, instead of money, he says, I'll give you, I, 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 um, I'll turn your money into dancing. And so that's when I found, um, um, formed the habit of really rejoicing, dancing in the presence of God, and only in the presence of God in my house. Even those periods, I'll call Emmanuel and Ephraim to the room. I'll put worship song and we'll dance and dance and dance. You know, so your life will move, will, will flow towards your predominant. Learn to be happy. Learn to see the positive, the good in every situation in life. And you will always not be a victim. You will always be a victor. You know, I think I, I listened to Miles Morrow talk about the spirit of leadership. And he said, the spirit of leadership is what the lion has. He said, the lion is not the, the most um, powerful animal in the jungle. The lion is not even the biggest. The elephant is bigger than the lion. The lion is not the strongest. But the lion is described as the king of the jungle. And he said, why is the lion described as the king of the jungle? Simply his mental belief, his attitude. And because he thinks of himself as the king of the jungle, jungle even though he's not as strong as the elephant, when the elephant sees the lion, the elephant begins to shiver. And so there is fear that makes the lion overcome most of those animals, not because the lion is stronger than the animals. It's actually fear. And that is fear comes from the heart and comes from the mind. And he says something, he says, no matter how gifted you are, no matter how talented you are, no matter the potential you carry, because the elephant carries the potential to actually be the king of the jungle because of its size and its strength. But the lion always overpowers it because of the lion's mental attitude. And at any time the, the lion sees an animal, all he thinks about is lunch. And so in your situation, in your life, as you think about, you know, you need to develop a mentally mindset. What do you see? How do you perceive situations and circumstances? Do you perceive come from the position of a victim? Or do you come from a position of a victor? And that is what sets the lion apart. He comes always from the position of a victor, not a victim. And because he knows who he is, because of that, every other animal bows to him. And so in your moving forward, coming up with a new you, you need to have the right perspective of who you are. In the church, it's, of course, this message, I can't begin to tell you who, who you are in God. But you need to go and renew your mind with the word of God so that you can be transformed to become who you are. So your perception of who you are, who are you? Not what people think you are. Who do you think you are? The most important thing is not what people think about you. It's who you think yourself to be. That's the most important thing. And that, that's part of my strength because I learned that a long time ago when I was a teenager. Let me tell you briefly, when I was doing my A-levels, people had a lot to say. Oh, she's not serious. She's always this, that, that, that. All her friends are first year students. She's in the second year. Instead of her to have friends among the second year students, she's just, um, 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 you know, squandering her time with the first year students. She's about to write her final exams. Yes, she's hanging out with the first year students who do not have any future ambition, <laughs> who are not serious minded people. You know, all those things were being said, and of course, it will fill her back. And I said, okay, is that what they are saying? And so in my life at that point, I began, began, began a game. I said, I'll give them more things to say, but I know who I am. And so the more they were saying, when they are sleeping, I am reading. I'll put my legs inside water, and I say I must prove these people wrong, because that's not who I am. People can't judge me. At the end of the day, my final exams in that whole set were only two people that passed enough to be able to read law. All these people that were talking couldn't get enough marks to get into law they went into theatre arts. I'm not condemning any course. But what I'm just trying to say is that I scored, and most of them were shocked. So it is not who people think you are. 
what people say you are should not define you. It's who you tell yourself you are and what you do with yourself that eventually defines you. And like Pastor began to say, when a woman is pregnant, after some time, maybe in the first like trimester, you will not know. But a time will come when you cannot hide it. Then people will truly know who you are. So you must, your, your perception of yourself must be very, very important. Secondly, why do you exist? You must understand why you exist because that will give you confidence. That will give you hope. Why are you alive? Why did God create you? And I'm, I'm not going to dwell on that. We, so much has been said on that. And number three, you must know your significance. You must know that the world needs you. You must know that this generation needs you. You must know and believe that you are important in the scheme of God's things, plans. You must believe in yourself that you are very strategic in these times and these seasons you are in. You must believe in yourself. You must believe that you are significant. You must believe that you are not a nobody. That God has created you and has packaged you for this time to be in a kingdom for a time such as this. Praise the Lord. And finally, in the next five minutes, so that we can close exactly at 11.30. In the next um, um, five minutes, I began to say that when Jesus Christ came, and the first message that John the Baptist is following, I began to say, was not talking about your spirit. It was attacking your mind. Repent for the kingdom of God is at hand. And briefly, before I go down this morning, I would like to tell you, because I began to say, why do you exist? You must believe that you are significant in the scheme of God's affairs. And so we need to go back to why you were created. When God created man, the reason why God created man was for man to rule and dominate, have dominion over the earth, and rule the earth as the kingdom of heaven. Man was supposed to be God's agent to bring heaven on earth. And so in Genesis chapter 1 verse 26, it says, um, you know, God created man, says have dominion over the earth, over, you know, over the fish, over the um, beast of the fields and everything. So God created the, the kingdom of heaven. Heaven has a kingdom. A kingdom is a territory, a place where there is a king. Where a king rules over a place. And the king enforces his will, his intent, his purpose on that place. So that the place now can begin to reflect the mentality, the culture, the mindset, the language, and the image of the king. So there's a king over. So when we begin to talk about, Jesus Christ began to talk about, repent for the kingdom of God is here. It means Jesus Christ came to bring down God's kingdom on earth. And we are agents of that kingdom. We are citizens of that kingdom. You know, I was, I was listening to my Moro and he described it like that. He used, um, of course, Bahamas, you know, as an example. But I'll use Nigeria as an example. So in the 19th century, Nigeria was under colonization. The British, Nigeria was a colony of the British government. So I'm just trying to make you understand, the British government was like a kingdom with Queen Elizabeth on top. And then Nigeria now became a colony. And when you, a, 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 a kingdom or a country colonizes another country, part of what it does, it sends its um, agent. And if people remember very well the history of Nigeria, at one point the governor general of Nigeria in 1914 that created Nigeria and named Nigeria was Lord Lugard. Lord Lugard was sent from England, Britain, to come and uh, um, um, oversee Nigeria and rule over Nigeria on behalf of Queen Elizabeth. And it was Lord, Lord Lugard that brought the Yoruba Kingdom, the Bini Kingdom, and the Fulani Emirates. They were separate. Nigeria, the way it was then, before 1914. Um, the Yoruba people had their kingdom, they are like a country. They Fulani, the Bini. But it was Lord, Lord Luga that came and amalgamated, brought them together into one unit and named that unit Nigeria in 1914. So Nigeria became a country. And that's how Nigeria got the name Lord Lugard. So I'm just thinking, just like Queen Elizabeth sent Lord Lugard, you know, to rule over this nation and everything, we are like that. We are agents of the kingdom. We are sent from heaven, and that's why God says he knew you before the foundation of the earth. We are not citizens of this earth, and if you understand that because of time, I won't go that, into that too much. 
you are that, if you know that you are not citizens of Nigeria per se, but you are citizen of the kingdom of God, then you know that you are not supposed to be subject to whatever is happening on earth here. You are subject to the economy. You are subject, you know, to the ways of the kingdom. If there is no sickness in heaven, the kingdom of God that you belong to, that you are a citizen, then you shouldn't have sickness in your body. Because the body here is what happens on earth here. And you are not a citizen of the earth. You are a citizen of the kingdom of God. And so when Jesus Christ came, he began to say, repent, change your mental, your mindset. The kingdom of God has come. The kingdom, begin to see yourself more as a citizen of the kingdom and not as a citizen of this earth. And that's why John the Baptist came and began to say, repent for the kingdom of heaven. Jesus Christ came, repent. And remember when the disciples of Jesus Christ came, and to ask Jesus, teach us how to pray. How did Jesus Christ teach them the most important thing? First of all, Jesus Christ taught them to worship God in prayer. Our Father, acknowledge God as your Father, who art in heaven. Hallowed be your name. Then the next, after worshiping God, the next thing Jesus Christ began to declare and say we should pray for, your kingdom come. Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Before you begin to ask for your daily bread. As the kingdom of heaven as God's agent, God expects you to steward the affairs of this earth. And that's why we began to talk about the 20 year circle God is giving us to redeem Nigeria, to colonize Nigeria, to take back Nigeria for Him, to bring out the reign, the rule, the culture, the ways of heaven into Nigeria. And I keep saying, we shouldn't be bothered. I heard my small say something. He says a lot of time we are talking about, you know, the, the Muslims who take over, you know, and everything. He says the kingdom of heaven is in heaven. They cannot take, ever take over that kingdom in heaven. They can't go to heaven and take over it. What they will take over is the religion. And Jesus Christ did not come for religion. Because what we are practicing is religion, but the time has gone, come, to go back to the message of the kingdom. And every one of you kingdom, you become an, a kingdom agent. And on behalf of the king of heaven, who is God, you now begin to colonize your sphere of influence. Everybody has a sphere of influence. Either in the education mountain, the media, the government, you know, religion, um, family, entertainment, business. Where is your mountain? You are supposed to, like Lord Lugard, bring everything together. And not, you, you find the reason why you speak English is because we are colonized by Britain, yes. Like um, Togo, for instance, I've gone to Togo. They speak French because it was France that colonized them. And so the language of Nigeria, of your sphere of influence, of the education mountain, of the business mountain, and every other mountain that God has given you a sphere of influence must reflect heaven on earth. God bless you. Pastor Wale.